Hello and welcome to Questions and Answers 1, Part 3. This week we are looking at is gravity pulling us all into the centre of the Earth and if not, why not? We are looking at what is the difference between SR and DL configurations and how do I contact PhD supervisors? and we'll be getting into some discussions at a pretty deep level. So most of the time there will be nothing or this for a discussion that anyone can understand, then we'll move up to this for medium level discussions and then finally over to here for the really deepest level discussions. So if the conversation gets a bit deep, don't give up, just skip ahead a bit. See you at the end. Okay, next question. If gravity pulls everything to the middle of the Earth, why are things like people still on the outside? Are they slowly being sucked in? That's a bit of a worry, isn't it? This is the kind of question which, at first, seems really simple and obvious. Well, of course we're not being sucked in. But it's when you try to answer why that we run into problems. And I've seen this kind of thing in all kinds of conversations, right from conversations with my friends all the way up to conversations, full professional conversations between scientists. And it's the kind of question that somebody asks and everybody just goes, why are they asking that question? As if it's not even worth answering when in fact they're not answering it because it is actually quite a complex uh, answer. I'll give you a quick answer now, which is number one, no, we aren't being sucked in. But number two, that does actually happen in some places. And in certain places, it happens a lot. So let's dive in. The first point is, why would we think that we could get sucked in? Well, of course, if gravity is pulling any, everything in, maybe the Earth could be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That's not happening. But another thought is, well, aren't we all floating around on this kind of liquid rock? In fact, the, the kind of rock that we call magma right? Magma comes out of a volcano, we call it lava at that point, and we can all see that it is liquid. And if we know a little bit about uh, geology, then we should know that the continents as well are floating around on the top of the earth and moving at a speed at about the rate that fingernails grow. So most people, I think, believe that there is liquid rock underneath the Earth's crust, and that's actually not true. And it's not true because the pressure on that rock, there is so much weight pushing down on it that it can't be liquid anymore. And it's all actually solid, all the way down to a place called the outer core, which is a liquid layer of molten iron. But that big orange layer just underneath the Earth's crust is solid rock, although it does move very, very slowly. The first point is this huge mantle zone underneath the crust is solid rock and, and that is supporting us and stopping us from falling down. But there's a more complicated aspect to this. It's not quite as simple as saying, well, it's solid rock, because there is another reason that we might be pulled into the centre of Earth. And that's because we are made almost completely of vacuum. And so is the rock underneath us. Almost completely empty space. What do I mean by that? Well, you know we're made of atoms, right? If you're not sure about atoms and molecules, check out my video, link up here somewhere. Those atoms are almost completely empty space. How much empty space? Well, if an atom was the size of a small town, let's say a sphere that had a small town right in the middle of it, then the nucleus, the bit at the very centre of the atom, would be about the size of a basketball. 
and an electron would be about the size of a P. But that electron would not be close to the nucleus. It would be somewhere in that huge sphere the size of a town. All the rest of it is empty space. So all of, I do this, bang. That is just my two hands, empty space, empty space. For some reason, they stop when they meet each other. And the big question is why? And in fact, that was a huge question about 200 years ago. They discovered that atoms were almost completely empty space. And they couldn't explain why atoms didn't just crush into each other then. Why can't you just crush an atom right down? Well, scientists couldn't answer that until they discovered quantum mechanics. So Erwin Schrödinger was the physicist who came up with a way of describing atoms using this new weird kind of physics. What actually happens is that we have the nucleus of an atom and around the outside we have our electrons but Electrons are not really like little balls, and an atom is not really like a little solar system. The way this electron moves is like a wave. Now, waves are completely different to particles. Particles hit each other and bounce off. But waves meet each other, interfere constructively and destructively, and go through each other and carry on moving. And what's special about an electron around a nucleus is that where it is around this nucleus is like a three-dimensional wave. We can think of a three-dimensional wave as being maybe like a balloon, which is contracting and uh, expanding and going in and out. That wave will tell us where we are most likely to find an electron. What that means, I'm going to make this nice and simple for now, that because the electron is going to be somewhere in this volume and this wave says you will be somewhere in here. That electron can say, well, only I am going to be here. No other electrons can be here. And that means when our other atom is coming along with its own electron, this electron over here says, no, you can't be in this space. This is my space. And this other electron from the atom comes over and that says, well, you can't be in my space. So at this point, they have to stop. They don't physically hit each other, but it just becomes harder and harder for them to keep moving as they get closer because those two electrons are saying, you can't be in my space, only I can be in my space. So eventually they stop and they will find a space, a distance between them, which is the perfect balance of sticking together and being pushed apart. Take this conversation a little bit higher. For those of you that understand some basic uh, quantum mechanics, we can describe this electron using four quantum numbers. And the Pauli exclusion principle says that no electron, more precisely no fermion, can have the same set of quantum numbers. What that means is if we take two electrons and put them over each other, exactly over each other, they will have the same set of quantum numbers. If we take two atoms and move the two nuclei together so the nuclei are almost touching, the electrons in their orbitals will overlap, the two sets of orbitals will overlap, and the electrons in those separate orbitals will have the same set of quantum numbers, and that's not allowed according to the Pauli exclusion principle. So the atoms must remain separated. It's one of those unpleasant explanations where you end up with because it's quantum mechanics. What this means is the reason we can't sink down into the ground is because of something called the Pauli exclusion principle. And what that means is even though atoms are mostly space, when they get together, the electrons say, you can't be in my space. They say that to each other and that pushes the atoms apart. It stops them from getting too close. So we are, by standing on the top of the Earth's crust here, are pushing down on the Earth's crust. The Earth's crust is pushing down on the mantle underneath. That's pushing down 
on the outer core and the inner core, but then they are pushing back. The Earth's core is pushing back on the mantle, the mantle is pushing back on the Earth's crust, and that's pushing back on us and keeping us up here. So the real reason we don't sink into the middle of the Earth is because the Pauli exclusion principle doesn't allow our atoms to go through the other atoms. All right, but didn't I just say that that does happen some places? And yes, it does if gravity is strong enough. Now, the more mass you have, the stronger gravity gets. And if you have a star that's only a bit heavier, more massive than our sun, for example, from about 1.2 times the mass of our sun up to about 2 times the mass of our sun, then the weight of gravity is so strong that that Pauli exclusion principle breaks down. These electrons aren't, aren't strong enough now to resist the other electrons being pulled in, those atoms being pulled together, and the atoms literally squash down together. Everything gets squashed together. The electrons get pulled down and squashed into the nuclei. The electrons get pushed into the protons and turn the protons into neutrons. All of those atoms go whoop into a very tiny, tiny, tiny small space. And that makes something called a neutron star. And it is incredibly dense. The uh, fact that everybody quotes is that a teaspoon of this material, about this much of a neutron star, would weigh the same mass as the whole of Manhattan Island in New York. So if something like that happened to the Earth and it squashed down and took all of the space out of the atoms, the whole Earth would compress into a size, into a sphere about 300 meters wide. Now, it can go farther than that. If we had enough gravity, we could crush everything down completely to an infinitely small point. And in fact, this is what happens if you have enough mass, the mass of about two of our suns. If you get to about twice our solar mass, then the gravity is so strong that everything crushes down and creates a black hole. The answer is, we don't get pulled into the centre of the Earth because the rocks underneath us and the Earth's core itself push back. They push back because of something called the Pauli exclusion principle, which stops atoms, even though they're mostly space, from occupying the same space. Except that if you have enough gravity, you can crush those atoms down into neutrons. And if you have more gravity than that, you can crush that whole star down into a black hole, which as far as we know is infinitely small. So it could happen if you're standing in the wrong place in the universe. First question. It's a memoria. It's a memoria has asked three questions. Question number one. What's the difference between SR configuration and DL configuration? Okay, so that sounds like... Uh, a really complicated question for the chemists, but there's something interesting for everybody here. So, what is It's a Memoria talking about here? Well, let's take a molecule like this one, okay? You don't need to worry about what these different atoms are, but you can see that this one in the middle has got four different ones around the outside, okay? And that means that it has no symmetry. There is no way that we can rotate the molecule and get back to where we started. There is no way that we can reflect the molecule down the middle and get the same thing. Unlike uh, a triangle, for example, where you can do all of those things. What does that mean? Well, that means that this molecule and its mirror image okay, are not the same molecule. Now, most of the time, they will work in the same way. 
they will do the same chemistry, have all the same chemical properties and physical properties until they meet another molecule like this. And we call these kinds of molecules chiral molecules. Chiral comes from the Greek word for hand because we have the same thing with our hands. Our hands look the same, but we all know that a right hand is different to a left hand. If we put our hands together, they are a mirror image, but we can never have our hands facing the same direction and have the thumbs on the same side. If we put the thumbs both pointing in the same direction, then now the front of my hand is facing you and the back of this hand is facing you. There is no way I can arrange these two hands so they fit exactly on each other. Why is that a big deal? Well, that is a big deal when, for example, a chiral molecule like this meets another chiral molecule. Because these two molecules will interact in a different way. This one, for example, let's imagine my hand here is a chiral molecule, will meet the black atom on the front right, it'll meet the white atom back left and red atom at the top. But we can't do that with this molecule because if we have black and white the same places, then at the top here we've got green instead of red. And if we match it so that green is up the top, then we find that the black and the white are in different places. Why is this a big deal? It's a big deal because most molecules in the human body are chiral. They are left-handed or they are right-handed, but only one of those. And in fact, we can have molecules that uh, the left-handed version is maybe a medicine or a kind of food, but the right-handed version is a poison. So this is very important to us when we are looking at these uh, chiral molecules. Now, what's really interesting about this idea that molecules can have a mirror image is that all of the sugars in living organisms are all of one handedness. In other words, let's call these sugars right handed sugars. All of the sugars in all living things are the D-handed, right-handed sugars. There are no left-handed sugars. Now we can make them in the laboratory, it's quite easy, but living things don't use them. And the same goes for amino acids. The amino acids, which are the little building blocks that we, our bodies use to build up proteins, are all of the left-handed kind. There are no right-handed amino acids, or at least very few, in living things. So the big question in chemistry for a long time was why? Because if you are making these molecules, it is exactly as easy to make this right-handed version as it is to make the left-handed version. It's physically the same. So why in nature do we have only one kind? And the reason is kind of interesting. Right back at the very beginnings of life, living systems must have been making both the left hand and the right hand versions of the molecules. But the problem is, if you have a mixture of left hand and right hand molecules, then one set is not going to fit. For example, if we shake hands with somebody, we can shake hands right hand to right hand, it's very easy. We shake hands left hand to left hand, it's very easy. But left hand to right hand, it's very difficult to properly shake hands with somebody, it doesn't fit. And it's the same thing with molecules. So you have to decide at some point. Which way are we going to shake hands? Right hand to right hand or left hand to left hand? And at some point in that very early dawn of life, 
Some living system found a way to make sure that it only used right-handed sugars. Because if it could do that, then it would not be wasting any energy making the wrong kind of sugar. If it decides, okay, I'm gonna use just right-handed sugars, then all of the molecules can shake hands nicely. But if it makes right-handed sugars and left-handed sugars, then the left-handed sugars aren't going to fit properly and they'll all be wasted. Now, of course, it could have decided to make only left-handed sugars and then the right-handed sugars wouldn't have fit. And that is true. Yes, it could have gone the other way. But what must have happened is that the living system that chose the right-handed sugars, probably by luck, got a little bit of an advantage. It got started before any other living systems. And because it wasn't wasting energy making the wrong kind of sugar, it increased and exploded and bred much more effectively than the other living systems that were still wasting half of their energy making the wrong kind of sugar. And you only need that small little advantage right at the beginning because you get exponential growth. If we imagine that these first living systems were cells, then you have one cell makes two cells, two cells make four cells, four cells make eight cells, and so on and so on. And this gives us this exponential increase. You only need to get started a little bit earlier than the competition, and you can get a big, big advantage. And suddenly that living system was able to take over all of the resources, first of all in its area and later in the whole planet. And we are all descended from that very first living system. So that is why we all have only D sugars and only L amino acids. But let's move on to look at uh, the question in a little more detail. Let's look at the kind of chemical details now. It's a memorial's question was, what is the difference between SR configuration and DL configuration? Well, this is how we talk about these two different kinds of molecules. How do I say this is one kind and this is a different kind? If I say this is the version with the black atom at the front, and the red atom at the back and the white atom uh, over here on the right and the green atom at the top, I've got to tell you where a lot of atoms are. So we have a way in chemistry of making sure that we can always say it very simply. We take the lightest atom, let's call this uh, one here white hydrogen, we turn that behind you, put it at the back, and then we go round the circle from the heaviest atoms to the lightest atoms. I won't go into the details here, but which way round we go from the lightest atoms to the heaviest atoms tells us if this is an S isomer, an S version of the molecule or an R version of the molecule. Quickly looking at this, that's chlorine, then we are going carbon oxygen. This is an R version of the molecule. And then that means this one must be the opposite, the S version of the molecule. OK, great. But then when we are talking about sugars and amino acids, we stop talking about S's and R's and we start talking about D's and L's. So the question is, why? Well, the first reason is S and R only tells us about one stereocenter at a time. We have to talk about this stereocenter and then somewhere else in the molecule talk about another stereocenter and then somewhere else talk about a third stereocenter. With a sugar, we are potentially looking at four or five stereocenters on the molecule. So we would have to say each R and S and R and S and R and S as we go along. With sugars, however, we know the configurations of those carbons as we go down the line of the molecule because it's in the name. Glucose is going to have a set 
uh, configuration of these S and R stereo centers, dextrose, ribose, pentose, all of those other sugars will have their own configurations. So it's in the name. The only thing we need to worry about is which version of glucose, for example, we have. Do we have the left version or the right-handed version? And we can define that very simply by writing out the sugar in the linear form with the aldehyde at the top and then just look at the hydroxyl group at the bottom. Then we decide from there, and this is an older convention than S and R, we decide from there if we have a D or an L. Is it on the right or is it on the left? And this was something that works for sugars, as I said, because we already know what the other ones are. Could we do it, change D and L for S and R? Yes, we could. But we've been using D and L to talk about sugars and amino acids for so long, chemists don't want to start changing everything now. We're keeping that convention for sugars and amino acids because it's what we've always been using. But it's not really much harder. It's just uh, a quick way of talking about which enantiomer of each particular sugar we have. Whereas S and R is good for talking about this specific uh, stereocenter. So the quick answer is we've already got a lot of stereo information about a sugar just from its name. And when we are looking at that final uh, stereo center to, to decide D or L, well, we've been calling them D and L for much longer than we've had the SR system and nobody wants to go back and change now. OK, question two. Why did you start a YouTube channel? For a few reasons. There's lots of really good science channels um, for physics. Uh, for example, there's Science Asylum, there's uh, Physics Girl, there's Veritasium, there are, there's Looking Glass Universe. But there aren't many good channels, or at least entertaining channels, for chemistry. There's periodic table of the videos, which is brilliant, but they tend to focus on kind of freak chemistry, kind of the fun bangs and things like that. And the other side are purely dry educational chemistry videos, which are for passing exams. So I wanted kind of a middle ground, something which is interesting and entertaining and informative. So uh, that's why I made it. Next question is from Kai, who says, I'm planning to continue to PhD study in Japan. Any tips for contacting potential lab supervisors? This is a really uh, tricky question. So the first thing we're going to look at is you are planning to continue to PhD work. Well, are you sure you want to do that? Here's the thing. Getting a degree makes you more employable and typically gets you a better salary than not having a degree. Then getting a master's degree typically makes you more employable and maybe gets you a better salary than having a bachelor's degree. That doesn't keep going into PhDs. If you want to do research for a career, then yes, you need a PhD. But you need to be careful that that is really what you want to do. Because once you get a PhD, you're extremely qualified in one very narrow area of the science that you're working in. And that makes it difficult to work in even a very closely related area. So, for example, for me as a chemist, 
I got my PhD in something called supramolecular chemistry. Well, it would have been very difficult to get a job in inorganic chemistry, for example, or many areas of physical chemistry. So you have to be sure that you really want to do a PhD. You have to be sure that you want to do this research. If you're not super sure about this, then I recommend that you get out with a master's degree at most. Now let's look at the second part of the question. You want to do this in Japan. Okay, but are you sure about that? Now, you've already told me that you are already in Japan, which makes that a lot easier. You already understand the working culture here. But it is not an easy place to get a PhD. There is a very definite laboratory culture. It can be difficult for uh, foreign people to fit in here as students. So you have to be sure that, uh, that this is a culture that you can work in and confident that you will adapt to those working uh, situations. Let's uh, assume that you, you know, you understand the culture here and that you are happy to apply for a PhD. Okay, so how do you contact uh, potential laboratory supervisors? Well, generally, you need to make some form of personal connection. What you don't want to do is send off an email that says, Hi, I'm looking for a PhD. Please let me know if you have anything. OK, I've genuinely seen emails like that. Start off with a hi. No, I haven't even put somebody's name at the top. Haven't put anything about themselves. Maybe they've attached their CV. Why am I going to open that? What you need to do is somehow make a personal connection. But most of all, you need to show that person that you know what their research is and that you're interested in it. The number one best way to make a connection is through your present laboratory supervisor. OK, so you will already have somebody that you know, maybe from your undergraduate research project or your master's project. They are absolutely the best people to make that connection for you. That doesn't always work out. So what's the next best way? The next best way is, if at possible, make a connection at a conference. It's really hard these days because conferences are being held online. So that is going to be really tough for you. But that personal connection is so important. You get to show somebody who you are and get the, to tell them a little bit of something about yourself. The other way is if you're going to contact them through an email, you need to show them that you understand what their research is and you need to show them that you have ideas and that you are prepared to work on this topic. What you might want to do is pick um, some of their recent research and send them an email, maybe with some questions. I'm really interested in this work that you did on blah, 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 blah. Um, how did you do this? Was this thing a problem? Da, da, da. Those questions show that you're thinking about it and that you understand it. Then finally, maybe part of that say, um, I was wondering if something like this would work. Would something like that be a good idea? Now, one thing you need to be careful of is applying to the super big famous guys in the field. They get people sending them emails all the time and it'll just go straight to the secretary and she will screen it out and, you know, they won't even see it. If you think that might be the case, then maybe you want to ask if perhaps a researcher at the lab could answer your questions and then you can make a personal connection there. So I think that would work for most uh, research groups normally, but here in Japan, 
the personal relationships between the research supervisors is so important that uh, the direct contact method might just not work. Okay, so the final answer is do what you can to get your present supervisor to help you find your next PhD group. Well, I hope that was interesting for you. If you have anything to say, if you have any questions, or if you have anything to add to the discussion, just write it down in the comments. If you like the video, I'll make more. And if you subscribe, you'll know when they come out. See you next time. Thank you.